All right, hi everyone, um, welcome. My name's Amy Frierson. I'm editor-at-large for Dezine. Um, we're here at the, in the greenhouse of Villanecchi Campillo um, for Milan Design Week. Uh, Gaganau is hosting a series, uh, we're partnering with Gaganau, um, hosting a series of talks. We've been here all week. Um, Gaganau's also got a great installation here called A Statement of Form. Um, and we're here, today's, today's talk is number three in the series. Um, and I've got joined by two fantastic panelists. Our topic is going to be design matters in post-pandemic times. We're gonna be looking a little bit about uh, how, how, I guess, architects and designers studios can be resilient in times of crisis. Um, I'm joined by Michelle Rojkind, uh, Rojkind Architectos, based in Mexico, and Dara Huang of Design House Liberty, based in London. Um, to begin, Michelle, maybe you can start by introducing yourself to the audience. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here amongst friends, of course. Uh, Michelle Rockin from Mexico City. I had my own practice almost 20 something years ago. Can't remember how long, but, uh, and I'm um, trying to do architecture uh, with impact that I'll show you a little bit. So Michelle from Mexico City. And Dara. Hi, I'm Dara Huang. I'm the founder of Design House Liberty. We do architecture and interiors and we're based in London. Wonderful. And as we sort of get going, uh, both our panelists are gonna give a, give a short presentation and um, Michelle, why don't you get started? Perfect, so I'll do something really quick. And um, so again, I was, there's an image of Mexico City there, but uh, I think that with everything that we're hearing uh, now, uh, what I'm, uh, I mean, talk about all the difficult news we have, uh, more information than ever, faster than ever. So my biggest concern, rather than what's happening with, with the news, is of course our planet, no? So what are we doing? What happened with the pandemic? What did we learn? What are we really focusing on? So we know all the facts, but we're actually always thinking that we're gonna go somewhere else, no? That we can make mistakes and just kind of evolve to a different planet or move to a different uh, place. But uh, uh, I always say that community is now. Community is not in the future. Community is not about what we can do uh, after. Uh, we have to take off the blindfold and we have to understand that the things that we've been designing for so long, uh, are we part of the problem or we're being part of the solution? So coming from Mexico City, um, the way we approach our projects uh, is about attention. What do we pay attention to? How do we select that things that we pay attention to? And then how do we adapt that to our process? Um, I always talk about having positive impact within the community, otherwise we wouldn't do the work that we do. Uh, challenge the program, reformulate the questions, and, and create added value. So instead of just answering the question that the client wants, is that, is that the right question? Can we sit down and reformulate that question to maybe create a broader experience? So Cinetec is one of the projects that we did in Mexico. It was a government project refurbishing the national uh, film uh, for Mexico City. And uh, we created this space that, of course, we, we try to comply with, with what the client had, had asked us, but we proposed more ideas. We proposed an outdoor cinema. We proposed these spaces that would actually uh, be prepared for having uh, people do whatever they want, not only come and see the, watch the film. So there's now uh, theater concerts, there's music concerts, there's, I mean, just the everyday happens uh, because the project is ready to embrace people and invite them in. So uh, this is the type of things that we do back in Mexico. I also think that architecture has to be a political act. Even though we want it or not, it is a political act. And for instance, the idea of, of um, designing a grocery store for a client, that could be something very simple. Uh, we propose to these people, these clients in Mexico, that this grocery store can also be a platform on the rooftop for the local uh, farmers in Toluca and the state of Mexico. So the idea of having a uh, something that we already know, but challenging the program, saying like, yeah, this is great, we can do a grocery store underneath, but what, what if the rooftop becomes this place where you welcome uh, all these farmers, and if they do a good job, then you start selling their produce underneath. And, um, and they agreed, and uh, it happened for a while. Uh, architecture to me is also interdisciplinary. It talks about the value of different minds coming together. So uh, I come from a musical background, so I don't believe in the idea that we do everything ourselves. Everything is a collaborative project and meeting the community's needs. So this is our first project that we're doing in, in the United States. And uh, I'm happy for the project because this, this is in Arkansas, in Arkansas and Bentonville, where everybody bikes and the community is growing even bigger. So we designed a building 
that um, has ramps so you can uh, bike up the building. So instead of having like the typical office space uh, or office building with two levels of, of um, uh, stores or restaurants and things like that, then you can bike all the way up to uh, get a coffee at, at that rooftop of the building. So that's our first project that's happening. So reading and understanding what the community is about and how we can really do something there. This is a collaboration between Marlon Blackwell, Kristen Callahan, and, 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 and Haruchi. Uh, so glad to be participating on the project. Stefan Sagmeister, great, great friend, is doing an art piece on the ramps. And uh, also thinking about collaborative economy. This is a project that I also am very dear to because it's very small. Uh, it's some cabins in the woods, but we rent uh, land from the farmers who have lost their sales streams so they can support and help staff the project that we're doing. So we come in, we rent the land, we work with them. It has, I mean, it leads to ownership. So instead of just buying uh, land from somebody, it's like, can we collaborate? Can we start doing things? And these cabins are in Mexico, in uh, uh, Malinalco and, and Valle de Bravo. And uh, again, it's a very small project, but we're happy that, that it's been done that way because again, I think the important thing is not only what we're designing, but it, can it be something re uh, regenerative? And I'm um, talking about regeneration. Uh, I also think that sustainability is not enough anymore. When we talk about let's sustain something, it's like if we sustain the current model that we have now, we're doomed. So the idea is how can we talk about regenerative architecture and, and, and things that really work and help the planet? And of course, walk the talk. You know, there's a lot of talk of things, people thinking of solutions, but is there the importance of not only what we do, but how we do it and the coherence of somebody that, that can really lead the way in different things and, and with purpose, of course. And this is the last project that I'll show you. Our Philharmonica in Boca del Rio in Veracruz. And um, this is a project very, also very dear to me because it, it ties my musical background to architecture. So i designing something that I could uh, figure out what the stage was going to be like, the acoustics, everything else. But it was not only about the project itself. It was how the project could regenerate an area. Uh, you have the Waybreakers there that was abandoned, so we kind of cleaned it up. There's more light there, so the fishermen came back. Um, the plazas are extended, so people, even if they don't go inside, there's some, something happening. And um, even though, I mean, the project, I, I really enjoy the, the process and people are very happy, there's one incident that really moved us when we were designing the project. And it's a small video that I'll, I'll, I'll pass really quick. And this was um, like a couple of months before the opening. Uh, the mayor of Boca del Rio uh, asked all the workers to, to come in. No? And uh, as sometimes that happens in Mexico, we all thought that like politicians, most of the time they're gonna scream at everybody saying that they are doing a lousy job or that they we're running late or something really bad. And um, it was totally the opposite. Everybody started gathering in the main area. And, um, and the beautiful thing is that you would start seeing all the musicians for the Philharmonica were starting to come out on stage, wearing hard hats and vests in a way to show to the workers that we're all the same, that the workers are working to build the concert hall and they're working as musicians once the concert hall is done. And um, again, it's this beautiful recognition of community is now, no? So when the Philharmonica played for the workers, the workers were like totally odd because nobody normally pays attention or says anything good to them. And they they were like, the, the concert is for us? This is really touching, no? So again, I mean, the, the video can, can go on a little bit. You can find it also on, on the internet, but it was a, an incredible experience. And really the last four months of the workers in that process were just amazing. They felt like they were doing something bigger than them, and they were, but nobody had recognized the importance of them as workers, no? So coming back to that, I just wanna close with uh, uh, just saying that, again, I mean, uh, look at the fishermen there. Communities now, let's stop thinking about what we're gonna do tomorrow, what's gonna happen in the future. Think of how you said hello to the guy in the door when you came in or when you leave this building. Let's not wait for another pandemic to happen. And let's wake up, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle. That's so fantastic. And I'd, I'd really love to know, actually, because I think you know, this sort of sense of social responsibility is so strong through your presentation and, and really inspiring projects. Do you think that's sort of, that sort of sense of social responsibility is something you feel you've always had? Or do you think that's something you really 
come into through, you know, your 20 years of having a practice and it's kind of developed over time? Well, I, I have to uh, acknowledge that I think it, when I look back at it, I, I think it's, it was my dad for sure. My dad was a National Science Prize in Mexico, a scientist, liver disease researcher, and he would say hi to everybody. And he made sure that we understood that people are people. It doesn't matter if it's the president or if it's the guy cleaning the street, they're all humans and should be treated equal. So I think that's something that I really owe it to him. And when we started doing architecture, it was like, yeah, I mean, there's somebody hiring me and he's paying me to do a building, but the building is gonna be in the streets for everybody, not only the guy paying for it. So it should serve not only the guy paying for the building, but it should serve a community. So we've been pushing a little bit more. And at the beginning, I mean, when you study architecture, nobody teaches you that. They, they teach you how to do architecture, but it's something that more and more it resonates with time. And of course, after all these crises, pandemics, wars, everything that's going on, it's like it just makes more sense than ever, no? And do you find, do you find you're sort of in the minority in that respect, or do you find that increasingly more practices are sort of starting to have that mindset and starting to kind of think a little bit more broadly about the types of projects that they take on? It, it, it's happening more. I just, I, I, my only concern is that, uh, I mean, people try to carry that flag. Oh, I'm a super social architect and I need to go to the middle of nowhere. To, like, like you, you need to practice and you need to do it everywhere because it is a social, it, it, social impact can happen no matter where. And it has to. So if you think that it only happens in an outside place where nobody knows about it and you're helping a look, you can help anywhere. Just choose where to help. Fantastic. Dara, I'm going to let hand over to you now for your presentation. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, that was very beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so uh, my name is Dara Huang, and I started an architecture practice about eight or nine years ago now. Time flies by very quickly. Um, this is actually Bosco Verticale, which is here in Milan. And I think that something that really inspires us and generates the way we think is always this idea of living within nature and having that really breathe in and out of the spaces that you're in. So we always, sorry. So we always ask the client like how they want to live and then how we can design their lifestyle. Lift your mic a little bit. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, and it's really important for us, the adjacency to water, to air, to light, and how that really has an impact on your life and in the space and in the ambiance of the space. And so it's really hard to tell in photos, but it's incredibly special and it actually can elongate your life and your health and your stress if you're living in a really peaceful and calm way. Uh, so we actually started as architects um, before we got into interiors and I think it makes it a unique proposition because all of our space are always very architecturally and sculpturally formed where we always think about how people interact with surfaces and how they can meet at certain points and expectedly and how there's certain carving and shaping of the space and then we start to kind of layer that. Um, with certain interiors. So all of our, when we get to interiors, all of our furniture arrangements and all the nooks and spaces and crannies that like we create are always very thoughtful and we're very inspired by the organic nature of shapes and how the idea again of creating community and how people can come together and how these sculptural spaces begin to speak to one another. So these are just some selections of our projects where you can see um, some common threads, which is, again, organic shape, connection to nature, and this love for raw materials and uh, nature. So over lockdown, that was very interesting. Um, we actually started a furniture collection. Um, at that period, and we are going to be launching very soon. So it's something extremely exciting for me. Um, it's our first furniture collection, and it is a sustainable collection. Um, and I just kind of created what I always wanted, which is stain-proof, beautiful designer furniture, because I have a six-year-old son with sticky hands, and um, I always wanted like very light and ethereal furniture that was affordable 
and um, incredibly comfortable because I feel like a lot of designer items is like a very stiff piece of foam. Um, and again, I want to use raw materials like real woods. Um, this is like a, we use vegan leathers and shearlings. Um, and I just wanted to give people the opportunity to own beautiful design items that wasn't just going to, you know, cost a fortune and only be to a certain few. So that we're launching, uh, <laughs> I'm like later on this year, fingers crossed. Um, and you will hopefully hear from that very soon. And Dara, we were talking a little bit before about um, how your studio kind of adapted and sort of post pandemic, obviously is the sort of theme of this talk, but I mean, broadly, like how is, how is, how is your sort of studio adapted and how do you, like, how do you feel you kind of learned from these periods and the way that you operate? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's been a very big topic. Um, you know, lockdown has been crazy. We've been through so much over these past two years. I was just saying, to Amy earlier, we had, you know, the invention of all these things that didn't even exist before, right? Like I was saying, reels only happened like, what, like a, a year or two ago, um, this uprise in, in all these crazy things. And so as a studio, we went from thinking like, oh, you could never work unless you're in a team in an office to all of a sudden being like, everyone's still working from home actually <laughs> at our office. And we realized that collaboration can be done from almost any country and anywhere. Um, and as a business, we, we evolved with all the things that were changing. So um, we actually went from being 100% institutional, doing like funds and developers, to actually doing a lot of private work now. So we're working with a lot of private homes, private villas, still global. Um, but we turned ourselves into, um, we were always doing interiors, but not at this level. So it's, it's just interesting that we don't go out there and seek to change or look for work. But the truth is, it was just like the private sector rised. And I guess, you know, the more institutional sectors got a little bit more quiet. And then now it's just about how to like work in these new attitudes and how to like blend everything together. So it's been, it's been quite a journey, but it's been fun and interesting. And it's nice that we can adapt in this way. And Michelle, your sort of practice, I mean, did you find that you kind of made big changes in the past two years as to how you operate? Or do you think it's kind of evolved a little bit more naturally? Well, it's interesting because I, I've had these conversations prior to the pandemic. So it kind of felt a little bit like we smoothed into what was happening. And I'll give a quick example. No, I used to run a, a firm that we, the biggest it got to was 60 people. And I didn't feel too comfortable with that because uh, I had great collaborators that wanted to leave to do their work and I thought it was great so they would leave. They would open up their firms but then they wouldn't get more work and they wanted to shut down their small office and come back to work and I would tell them like, no, 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 keep your small office. Maybe there's a way that we can collaborate. So I downsized to six people as a core and most of the people that left my office, I still collaborate with them. But there's something also learning from the past that previous architects always have collaborated, but never gave credits to the people they collaborated or with, or they left the credits like the last two people on a 400 people page, <laughs> that, that was their collaborators. So, so I, I'm, I read a lot uh, of the, and, and love being in contact with new generations and talking about open source and they're more collaborative than we were before. So the idea of collaboration to me just makes sense. So today my practice is my office plus the office that I'm collaborating with, I have them as equals. Yeah, they're ex most of them are ex-employees of mine with their own practice. And um, it's great because with, with maybe six people, we're managing almost 120 people, but with smaller offices. So everybody has a smaller kind of economy and, pr and practical way of working. So it's better for everybody because if projects come, it's okay. If there's not a lot of work, it's still okay because you're not really having to have that uh, maintaining a, a bigger office. So when the pandemic happened and we were most of the time collaborating a relatively freelance way, satelliting, I mean, everything is central in my office, organization is central in my office. The way we present to clients is exactly the same no matter who I'm collaborating with. But um, again, it's an open source. Whoever brings something to the table, I share that knowledge to the offices that we're working with. So it's been an interesting 
model, and I think today it's super practical to work that way. I couldn't think of any other option. Do you both, I mean, this is probably a question to both of you. Do you sort of think architect, architecture sort of become, you know, this sort of siloed, siloed kind of thing, and this idea of like having a more collaborative approach is just sort of something that that we're kind of n not used to in architecture, and like we can sort of start to do more and more. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and again, maybe this has to do with my musical background. No, I, when I was a musician, I was a drummer, and I loved playing with people. I mean, if you heard a great musician, it was like, wow, let's get together and jam. So when I started doing architecture, that rarely happened. Everybody was like, why do you want to work with me? I'll do your work, I'll do my work. I was like, no, let's, let's see what we can share. And uh, Winka, who just arrived, knows that because we are great friends from the, uh, back in the days and we collaborated a lot. But bringing more people to the table, bringing sociologists, anthropologists, landscape designers. At the beginning, I would, I would invite my friends to pitch in to reframe that question that I was talking about when a client has a program and he thinks that's the, the greatest question he can ask. And then with this team, we would make him see that there was a better option and reformulate that question. But if I was the only one in the room saying like, me as the architect, I'm gonna make you change your mind, it's like, it doesn't happen. So if there's an economist, if there's a sociologist, if there's more people at the table, he, the clients that we're understanding that we're giving them advice, advice to be, there's gonna be time spent, money spent, and the outcome can be very different. So what's the best use of that time and that money? And um, with time, now clients come to the office because they're asking that. They're asking that question like, what, what can we do? Can you bring all these experts and sit them at the table to figure out what the results are? And I think, I mean, to me, it's the only way I could imagine my practice also, no? Um, so we do a lot of interiors. So I think collaboration for us kind of like comes with the, the roles. Um, but we do collaborate on architecture as well. So we, collab we collaborate um, with offices with more people, so we've worked with Zaha or Fosters or um, SOM, and it's usually they're like doing the, sh the shell and we do the everything on the inside basically. But then we also, yeah, collaborate with smaller offices and we bring them in and yeah, it's really quite nice um, because we also give a lot of projects away as well <laughs> because you can't do everything, you know? I mean, you too, it's like, I remember when I first started my office, um, I was talking to Kai, who's who, you know, kindly brought us here today. And he's like, you're not friends with all the other designers? And I'm like, well, I'm so busy working that I hadn't, you know, made the effort. But you and are friends. No, I am <laughs> now, you, you guys. I've been doing this for like nine years now. Now I'm friends with all of them. And he was like, you should really be speaking to other designers. They're a great source of work and they're a great source of um, collaboration. And I was like, oh, I know, I didn't think about that, you know. But, but there's also like, uh, one of the important things, there's a lot of people that said, s say that they're collab they collaborate and they don't. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm a collaborator. We're gonna do this my way. It's like, no, that's not a way to collaborate. Collaboration means you're open to ideas and you're open that the ideas are not only yours and you're open to this kind of shuffle that, that again, maybe it's, it's easier to understand as a musician when you jam with somebody. It's not your song, it's not your music, it's what comes out at the moment. And that's what true collaborations are about. When you can sit with somebody and, and, and just do something that the result, you wouldn't do that, and the other person wouldn't do that, but it's this great kind of mix and match that comes out, and it's like, wow, I hadn't it's, seen it through that perspective. I think that's easier for us because Michelle and I, who have been friends for a while, we're very like, uh, what's the word? We like to, we're very inclusive, so we're like a party. We're like, okay, come, everyone's invited. Everyone, come, come. And not everyone is like that, you know? Some people like control and they like to dominate and we're just, Again, it, it's a personality thing. Because, yeah, I love collaborating. In fact, we're talking about collaborating now, right? So it's, I think it's, uh, I think we're just very special <laughs> and unique. <laughs> we're trying to inspire everybody else out there to do it. And actually, one of the topics that came up in um, one of the previous conversations we've been having this week was sort of like relating to the idea of what the role of the designer is or the role of the architect in this case. Um, and sort of this idea that it's no longer about sort of I mean, it's about problem solving, but not necessarily about, ans like, uh, it's not about necessarily just developing the answer, but sometimes framing the question, you know, creating the brief, not just, not just sort of 
doing what is asked of you, but to sort of understand or think about what should be done and you know what 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 isn't thought of and being that kind of creative mind in the process. I mean, I, I try to explain it in a very simple way. No, when I when I was showing my presentation, I, when I was saying like, let's wake up. It's not like I mean, of course, there'll be more pandemics and there'll be more stuff. I mean, everything's going to be thrown at us. I think there hasn't been a time where everything was failing at the same time. Like if you're, you're hearing everything. It's like, what are we going to do? There's this sense of like, oh, we can't control the future. So the future is right now, no? So the idea of let, let's just wake up and let's wake up to what we're doing. Because most of the time, and the example is like, for instance, this, this bottle, no? And I have friends that are designers that could tell you, I'm the designer of the cap of this bottle. So they're just focusing like s just on the cap. And they're, they're like the best cap designers. And they talk about how beautiful their cap is. And I'm like, yes, but is the water... Is the bottle for water or for cyanide or for what, what's the bottle for? So if you're not paying attention to what you're designing for, then you're part of the problem or are you part of the solution? So it's like, let's take a step back and what are we supporting? Because we might think we're doing like the best job ever, but we're working for something that's not best for all of us, no? So just the idea is, it's okay. I mean, do great design. That, that's when all my friends were doing like all these plexiglass stuff for the pandemic. I'm like, guys, that money should be spent in in healthcare and, and doctors and hospitals instead of doing all this thing that we're gonna throw away and we're actually seeing that happen. No? It's like what a waste of, of time and money spent on the different things as a whole, no? as a society in this amazing planet. So just a little bit of let's do what we do but, but let's see how we're doing it and what is it, where does it end in all this equation of life? No? I mean, it's an interesting analogy, this idea of the bottle. I would say like, Another way to formulate that is I always find that designers really design in a silo. And I say that because usually they're really like within themselves. They're, they're designing something, but they're not really thinking about like the demand, like who's buying it, what do they need? So I always think you have to think about people first and it, you, it's always about the consumer and it's about what's happening. So I've had an office for almost a decade now. So we had to go through um, well, the first recession, and then there was Brexit, and then there was, um, you know, Hong Kong riot, because we had a satellite office there before the riots, and now we don't have one there anymore. Um, and now we're dealing with a pandemic and a war, and, it, it, and all these things have a direct one-to-one uh, -one reflection on what's happening with your work. And it's not like you purposely start to switch things and move things in order to um, go with it, but uh, you know, there's things that are happening with the market. So like usually it's it's between commercial and resi. So like resi will be up and then commercial will be down and then commercial will be up and like resi will be down. And right now it's like we're kind of dealing with this fact that um, the office market is a little bit in flux because it's changing so much right now. Like, you know, leases went from 20 years to five years to three years. Now it's a flexi space. Now we don't even know if we're going back. And, and so there's... Uh, it's just like if you're just a designer and you're just thinking about like what's on your paper and you're not like working with the fluctuation, fluctuations that are like happening around you, then you're really missing out on a lot of stuff that's going on. You're not really thinking. And it's not like I sit there and read the FT every morning and I'm like, okay, well, the market and tech's up. So now we're going to go focus on that. It's almost like you have to listen to your gut and it's a lot about intuition. So, for example, I created a furniture line, which it had like, I think, interesting timing because all of a sudden we were stuck at home. People were, yeah, a lot more focused on their home space. People were like, you know, the home used to be this place where you used to like throw your stuff and pass out and then leave the next day to go to work at like 7 a.m. and like squeeze into a, a, a tube or something. And now it's like people are there a lot more and they're being more sensitive and thoughtful and they're, they care about their home furniture and, and they're able to buy things online without like flinching because we've been buying things online for the past two years now, right? As big or as small as, as it gets. And so, yeah, I think being able to kind of push into the needs of demand, the needs that are happening around us, that's part of our jobs as designer. You've got to like listen to your gut and your intuition, not just focus on the bottle cap, right? And I mean, we, yeah, like you sort of both touched on, we have, we've been through a lot of a lot of what we would class as crisis, you know, war. In the UK, we have having Brexit. We've had the pandemic. There's this kind of, there's this 
ongoing list of things going on. What would you say, and this may be a question to both of you, like, what else, what have you kind of learnt that maybe you didn't feel that you know before, and like, what, how do you think, how do you think as design studios you can be resilient and responsible in, in these kinds of times? I, I think that maybe one of the most important lessons is that we can slow down, and it's okay. Because this, the speed, I mean, I don't know why we all said, yeah, speed is okay, and rushing is more success, and then suddenly this slowdown, it's like, wow. It made, a lot, it made us think a lot of, about a lot of things. I mean, this introspective moment of the, during the pandemic, and, and first of all, acknowledging that we're fortunate to have a place where we could be during the pandemic, and what happens with that, if, if I'm privileged enough to have that space, what can I do for others? Which is also something that at least started uh, raveling through my mind uh, very often, like how can I be of service if, 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 I'm, if I'm here and I can really be at home and, and, and witness everything that's going on, I, I need to serve other people, not only as an architect, but as a human being. So, so the idea of slowing down and understanding that, and it's been there for a while, but you have all these other big institutions and companies like just saying, no, 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 we're back to normal again. Let's rush again. Let's fly more. Let's do more. It's like, do we want to do more? And I'm really learning from newer generations where they're, they're really more balanced than we are. They don't want to work as hard because they want a more balanced life. And it's being very hard for us to understand that because we're like, no, no, you have to work. How many days do you have it? How many hours per day? You have to work all of them. And they're like, no, I'll work a little bit and I'll travel a little bit. And we're like, these are, they're so lazy. They're like, no, 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 it's just a different generation. They're getting things in a different way than we are. And there's a lot to learn there because I really hope that they end up having a little bit more balance. I mean, I, I try to balance my life, but I only, I mean, I've only slept for hours <laughs> in general. I, not, not something new, but uh, uh, that way I can maybe do a little bit more of the balancing. But, uh, but again, it's okay to be on a slower pace. And it's okay to have this introspection moment to understand what we really want to do. And what you were saying, it's interesting to see how many people quit their jobs and you see all these little entrepreneurs now doing all these sort of new businesses after the pandemic because they're like, I don't want to be working for that company anymore. I want to do my own stuff. And they're trying stuff out. So we're like better testing everything now. That The world now is kind of like we're in this program that it's a simulation mode and let's see what happens if they click this button and they're like, okay, now we need to shift and adapt. And, and when you talk about crisis, it's funny because in Mexico, we've always been in crisis. I mean, I, I remember my parents talking about crisis when I was growing up. But it, crisis to us just meant have a, a mentality that is adaptive to solutions. Come up with things because there's always been a certain type of crisis. So now that we're seeing the world in crisis, you're hearing everything from the mass shootings to the wars to everything. It's like, what are we doing? How can we really be of service again? And uh, not only, again, as professionals, as in, in the work that we do, but as humans on our day-to-day -day basis. I was just going to say, um, I mean, it makes me sort of think, ultimately, sort of times of crisis are opportunities for architects, and not opportunities in the sort of like, you know, opportunities to make profit, but an opportunity, I guess, for architects as problem solvers to sort of show what they can do and really, you know, make a difference or sort of really respond appropriately, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think everyone's problem solving, like you're saying, not just architects. And I think, yeah. Lift your mind. Oh, sorry. I think what's really interesting about what's happened over the last two years is I don't even think we've realized or seen how many changes that have happened. Um, and I'm always thinking very macro, and I think it's important that, like, designers, again, think, think big. But if you think about it, like, the rise of... Um, mental health has been hugely transparent. I think there's been a lot of this like stuck at home idealism and all of a sudden people are happy and open to talk about it where it used to be like taboo, probably like two years back, right? <laughs> Only two years. And people are now um, redefining beauty. So beauty is no longer like your perfect skinny model. It's now people of all sizes and we're seeing how that's like changing through um, advertisement and how we're represented and I just think that everyone's more like focused on this idea of um, being themselves rather than being somebody else and there's been a huge rise in like content creation and people creating their brands and people doing their own thing which I think is really 
cool and interesting. And yeah, there's a lot of cross collaboration that's been happening, which has been been really nice. Um, and I also like one thing that happened with our business that made us like rethink the way we work was the supply chain. So we went from services to going into products and um, I think any designer out there who's working with a product has experienced some like crunch of pain in the supply chain because usually they're manufacturing from a cheaper country and then they're, you know, bring it in. And then we saw the raise of oil prices, the raise of the price of a container, the raise of um, logistical costs, a shortage of raw materials. So all of these things in combination have like forced us to be more creative about funny enough, our carbon footprint. So I was just saying um, there's a lot of companies, including myself, that had to explore doing local manufacturing. So like local factories that like service uh, different parts of the world. So even though it's like one brand and one, one, well, when I say one, we've got like many different SKUs, but we're doing furniture, that we would have three factories that serviced um, different parts of the globe and then we would feed into um, countries that we were supplying. And so this idea of local manufacturing is something that I don't think people considered before because the cost of logistics was so low that didn't make a difference in your bottom line. And now they're so high that even though the cost of local manufacturing might be higher, it's then offset by all the other costs. And it's also great for the environment and it's great for, you know, to be sustainable, which is, which is really nice. And, and, and sustainable, I also think, is um, really thinking about how what you do is beautifully designed, well-crafted, and lasts the, the, the length of time. It's not about, oh, this is made out of a recycled bottle, because actually a bottle makes a better bottle in its afterlife, because it can become a bottle again. Where if you take a bottle and you turn it into, I don't know, something else, let's say a bag or a shirt, and it can't be anything else after that. So if you, so what I'm trying to say is if you create like a great piece of furniture and it's going to last you 30 years, you're going to reupholster it and you're going to give it, you know, you're going to not throw it away um, as if it's like from Ikea or something, but you, you keep using it again and again, that's far more sustainable than, than thinking about this was, you know, made out of a, a bottle <laughs> and then I'm going to throw it away. I think now would probably be a good time to ask some questions for the audience. Do we have anyone that'd like to ask a question? Don't be shy. No? Oh, we have one here at the back, yeah. this gentleman in the white shirt. If you could just hold on just a moment for the microphone, and it'd be wonderful if you could also stand up so we can see you. <laughs> I was just going to ask where you are producing your furniture. Because you talked about the supply chain. Yeah. Well, that's a really good question because um, it is a startup. So we went through a huge exploration and, okay, you guys, I'll tell you what my learnings is, right? The, the end of it all, because I tried probably about eight different countries and, um, I, and we tendered, and in every country we tendered to probably about at least three suppliers in each. So we were talking about like a tendering to almost, you know, I would say between 20 and 30 different companies. And, and you know, anyone who's done a product knows that it doesn't end. Probably through the length of your product, you're gonna be changing suppliers until you find like that perfect marriage where everything works, like the reliability, the quality, the cost, like everything's in harmony. It's like this never ending fluctuation. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is the end of it all is it's all about, I hate to say it, but cultural attitude. Um, and there's certain stereotypes of every country and the way we work. Um, I'm not gonna like like repeat them because I think we all like know in our heads like the Japanese, the Swiss, the Germans, the Americans. You know, like you already kind of know like what they're good at. And I think it's really good to just like push into what a country is already just amazing at. Um, and then it's all about the attitude of the the workers and how willing they are to work with you. Um, so we have a light company, this teardrop that we made, and um, we kind of made that out of like accident. Um, I, a lot of our products come by chance, and we started making it in the UK, but then we realized like the Czech Republic was far better in glass. 
So you kind of, you just go to like where the supply is the best. So for example, outdoor material, you got to go to where they make great hardwoods or great, um, you know, you like, you think, oh, Indonesia, you think, you know, a lot of these like hardwoods or Brazilian hardwoods. So you always start by like the materials, um, what they're naturally good at. And then it's all about like cultural fit and attitude is everything it's it's all about attitude and sometimes that's like um specific to the factory owner and it's a lot of a lot of trial and error as you must know so yeah we make kind of all over the place this is short of it do we have any do we have any more questions anyone else well in which case i'm going to continue to ask one actually i think this kind of question of entrepreneur this sort of an entrepreneurial spirit is an interesting one like do you think it's do you think to be to be kind of agile in 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 the world of architecture and design like you have to be entrepreneurial you know you kind of have to be thinking about different businesses or different approaches as rather than sort of just practicing design in the sort of traditional sense i mean i would say definitely you know that, that again it, it has to do with a sense of awareness so so that awareness uh, and the flexibility of having an organic form of thinking and practicing so if it's an organic organization, it, it's flexible. No, if it's this thing that it's set on stone and this is the way we're going to work for the next how many years? <laughs> we could predict before the pandemic, and now people are saying we can't predict even the next six months. No, so so again, yeah, I think that it, it's important to have that. That it's an exercise. It's you're flexing a, a, a muscle. No, the, the 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 brain is always practicing and understanding. Like, yeah, this works now. What's going to happen tomorrow and the next day? So I think that um, not only engaging a practice where you're doing, where you love design and you love the outcome of design and everything is like, oh, yeah, but, but, but what is design right now? What's happening in the world right now? And what's, what's the reaction? So I always say that I'm, I'm super frustrated how we repeat programs. For instance, we're doing, when people think of a house, they still are like, yeah, a house is a, a, a guy and a, the, the man and the woman who are married and they're gonna have a boy and a girl. I'm like, are you serious? Like, look at the, how the world is changing and you're still thinking of the typical house and we keep repeating these programs, institutional programs, and like if they were the same and society is changing so much that, that nobody is raising their hands saying like, we should have, all these amount of different programs, no? From A to whatever letter in the alphabet or two alphabets, we need to really create that broad scenario, no? But uh, again, the more awareness, the more responsive we could be. I think um, I've, lo I've met a lot of entrepreneurs and I work with a lot because we do, you know, offices, hotels, like all sorts of things. And I notice that entrepreneurs always have this, um, three things in common. One, they're incredibly optimistic. I've never met an entrepreneur that was like, I can't do it. Oh, this, this is over. <laughs> I always feel like they're their own cheerleaders. They have to believe in like, they have to have so much conviction in themselves and what they're doing. Um, so one is that they're incredibly optimistic. Two, they're incredibly opportunistic. And what I mean by that is um, you have the ability to, number three, like kind of connect ideas and connect uh, opportunities together um, and I think that that's probably something that I'm pretty good at um, and and I say and it's funny because you know I was just talking about how people have this um, awareness of mental health and how they're being a lot more transparent so about myself it's it's funny because people naturally think that you know, I'm like super organized and I have everything like figured out. But the truth is, it's like I actually have uh, I, I actually have an incredible struggle with attention. <laughs> like my mind is always like going back and forth all the time. And actually, that's really good because I can easily connect the dots very quickly between people and ideas and opportunities and it so it makes business for me flow incredibly quick and I always say like I feel like um like I feel like we as a company we get so many opportunities and it's amazing because we don't I don't know it's some type of weird weird like karma like it somehow like it comes back to us because we're constantly connecting other people and connecting ideas and connecting thoughts and things and then somehow it kind of like loops back around and so um, I'm taking something very negative about myself like hey I have ADD I don't actually know if I do to be honest but I do um, 
I, my mind wanders a lot and I get bored very <laughs> easily. And I've turned that into a positive, which is like, actually, I'm a really great entrepreneur. I can connect the dots. I can think about things. And I like to really, and, and I think a genuine um, thing about entrepreneurs is we love to help people. We've heard about Michelle sit here and talk about how he wants to help the workers and the community and the people and, and the moms and whatever. And well, I'm the one that wants to help the moms. And I'm always, I'm always wanting to help people. And I think like as architects, it's all about like helping who's using it. As entrepreneurs, it's all about like help, thinking about how we can help other people. And, and that's like a great way to also kind of connect dots and have opportunities kind of come back to you. At a practical level, I mean, obviously it's a really fantastic thing that the world is being more inclusive. We're sort of trying to sort of deal with issues like mental health. As a business owner, how, how challenging is that? Like, you know, to sort of t to adopt this new approach and try and bring in that level of flexibility and that sort of level of openness. How does that, how does that work? And how have you found that, particularly Dara as a business owner, but maybe also both of you? <laughs> um. I don't know. It was it, it was a direct it was a direct question. No? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was asking him to go first because I'm not sure if I understood it. So, how have we found? How are we approaching flexibility? I guess like how is it? Has it been challenging as a business owner to sort of bring in that level of flexibility in amongst your team? You know, I'm a very odd business owner because some, you'll, and you guys will experience this through your life. You're going to meet two types of business owners. One that are control freaks. Like I do the finances. I, my, you know, I am on top. I need to know every cent in my bank. Like, ah. And then um, I'm almost on like the very opposite end of the spectrum. I'm very non-controlling and I'm like, I don't care where you work and when you work as long as it's done. Like I'm very like results driven. Like I, I just need to know that um, my team is on it and I don't care if they're on another planet. In fact, one of, um, one of my girls who's here in the audience, uh, I was like, meet me in the office on Friday. And she goes, I moved back to Bulgaria. I was like, oh, you did? <laughs> I didn't even know <laughs> because during the lockdown, so many people moved back to the residual countries. And I don't care. I'm like, okay, fine, live in Bulgaria. Like, you know, like do whatever you want <laughs> because she's on it, you know, and she's like messaging me. Um, I've always been a big WhatsApper. It's gotten pretty bad where like, I don't necessarily read my emails anymore. Don't worry, I have other people that help me. <laughs> read my emails, but um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, so for me, like that adaptation has been perfectly fine. I also love working, um, <laughs> sounds awful. I love working alone. No, what I mean by that is I have the most beautiful studio in London and I love that, you know, I have all this like <laughs> space to think. Um, I know, saying that, you girls, please come back. I want you back. <laughs> um, but what I like about the office is instead of it being like, you have to be there from nine to five or you're going to get fired if you're like 10 minutes late, you know, and it's on your probation. It's more like, here's a place for us to collaborate, for us to come in, to, for us to have meeting. And we have materials on the desk. We bring clients in. So it's a really, really like focused meeting on like, this is about this. And then once we're done talking, we all go home and... I like that with work-life balance. And I think, you know, you got people that are better at night, me, and people that are better in the morning, like you. <laughs> we, we came in this morning, and he's like, woo -hoo! And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> my brain is still waking up right now. Um, and so I really like that flexibility. I like this ability that we can be anywhere and do it. I don't even care. Just, you know, just do it. <laughs> what about you, Michelle? Do you have any thoughts to add? No, I, I think that a, a little bit of the same, but I have to say that that I do miss people. I mean, with, during the pandemic, I mean, I got my besides all the zooming and I, my eyes, I, I think that it just killed me during the, that that time. Um, and the, the funny thing is that we we thought technology kind of separated us, and there was two sides of it. No, I mean, the, yeah, technology maybe separated us a little bit, but you were actually seeing people in their homes, where it was like, wow, that's where you live. Show me the camera. Oh, that's your kid. Oh, okay. You were seeing like everything of their aspect of their lives. So we also became a little bit like, yeah, this is where I live. And yeah, somebody's shouting in the background. It's okay. So that, that made us a little bit more connected to our people. But I, I, as an architect, I have to say that 
uh, working in an environment where people are doing like the physical models or we're doing something or you're overhearing a conversation, it's kind of really quick to pick up. And I, and I miss those meetings, no? So uh, I have like whoever wants, I mean, people come in, of course, but there's also this flexibility if somebody's gonna go out or, um, yeah, just make sure you're paying attention to your WhatsApps or whatever, so we have that conversation, no? And, um, and again, it's understanding newer generations that they don't wanna work a nine, a nine to five and they don't wanna be like in the, in the, it's like, okay, if you're doing the job and we're working and this is pushing, but um, I'm very, very social. I really need to be around people, and I love the idea of having a space that it's just I'm more, uh, not the production of work per se, but our interests and methodologies and process of what we want to pursue as architects and designers. That's 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 a little bit like more of a studio, creative studio that that is the effervescence that feeds into the daily work that I miss. Oh. We're sort of running out a little bit out of time, but I'm just as a sort of final question. I guess I would. I would ask you both what advice you would give to young architects, young designers, you know, starting out um, about how to kind of be resilient and to sort of, to, you know, to create a business that can adapt to times of crisis. I always say first start with something you absolutely love, guys. I mean, that goes without a doubt. And, and the reason I say that is because before I decided to be, well, what I am now, um, I was always thinking about like get rich quick like mechanisms you know I think we all sit there and we dream about oh let's just like dabble in this and you know and, and then we're like woohoo we're, we're in the gold and, and that's not how a business is a business it grows and it takes time to build a brand and if you're like if you're you know not even breaking even after whatever three years let's say um, then people switch and they get dismayed very quickly because they're like, oh, well, I'm not making any money and I'm working really hard. Guess what? <laughs> That's called starting a business, okay? Um, and if you don't love it and you don't have this like passion to just like keep going at it, then you'll just switch. And you don't wanna be a person that just like switches and switches and switches. So you have to do like, what's innate in you and I always say that people are always like yeah I want to build a brand but what they don't realize is that they've already built it it's them they are the brand it's what they love who they are like what they project and now with social media you can see that um you know I was saying it's not popular to hire a model now it's popular to hire a real person for who they are and they don't have to change who they are that's actually why they're attractive and that's taken out by your personality everyone has a personality everyone has something that they represent and, and, it, and like today with social media it doesn't matter if it's like cooking childcare like clothes like whatever um, you need to feed into you do something you absolutely love and then find a demand like what how do you monetize on what you love um, and again don't think about money think about love that is the only way you'll be the best at what you do is if you're already good at it and you're already like something you're very passionate about and I would add the idea of, again, working on ourselves, no? This idea of awareness. The more we're aware of ourselves, the more we will be aware of our environment and the, what we're doing. So, and the coherence of that, no? So, when I say let's walk the talk, it's, I mean, um, design is about producing ideas and the importance of ideas. But um, let's do it with purpose, no? And uh, let this be a, I mean, let's learn from everything that's going on and what's happening and let's figure out, again, if we're, part of this problem or part of a solution that's that's a better future for all of us. So yeah, just awareness and and purpose. Perfect. I think that's the that's a that's a fantastic end note. Um, I just want to sort of take the opportunity to say thank you for all of you that came today and also those tuning in digitally. Um, this is the last in our series of three talks. But we've had two other great ones uh, in previous days um, which are available to watch on Dazeen. Um, Please, please check them out. We've got some some other great speakers as well. And thank you so much to, to Villanecki for hosting us here and for Gagano, who've been a fantastic partner in this project. Um, thanks very much. Have a great day. Thank you.